Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Operationalizing Data Governance for Accountability and Transparency, sponsored today by SODA. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To access and open the Q&A or the chat panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Anand Seth Kumar and Latravia White from Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, Anand is a seasoned technical leader specializing in data engineering and systems integration. He has worked at Abercrombie and Fitch for the last 10 years and has a proven track record of delivering production grade applications and is adept at integrating complex systems and leveraging cutting edge technologies. He is passionate about all things tech. And Latravia is a seasoned data governance manager with over a decade of ex expertise in the data industry, having held a wide range of roles from data custodian to stewardship and even leading enterprise system upgrades with her, her current role being at Abercrombie and Fitch. She, her deep passion for transforming data practices drives her to excel in bridging the gap between business stakeholders and technology teams. She is dedicated to implementing innovation, innovative data strategies that not only enhance business outcomes, but also foster seamless collaboration across the organization. And with that, I will give the floor to Latravia and Anand to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, I would like to start off by uh, uh, thanking SODA for this opportunity, for the speaking opportunity. And uh, we are very excited to be here. And uh, we've got some great content for you and hope you um, enjoy these. All right, so um, I believe we've covered the introductions, but I'm just uh, going to go over it again. Uh, so my name is Anand. I'm a staff engineer here at Abercrombie & Fitch. Uh, been with Abercrombie for a little more than 10 years and been in the industry for a little over 15 years. Uh, I primarily focus on data engineering and data operations. Uh, and uh, I my role currently is more towards the infrastructure and automation side of data and analytics. And I will let my colleague Latravia introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Latravia White and I've been in Abercrombie for about a year and a half now. Um, I've been in the data industry for about 10 years. My current role is data governance manager. So focusing on everything data governance, data quality, data management, and um, data catalog and lineage. Right on it. Thanks. Thank you, Lefrey. All right. So let's start off with the uh, problem statement. So uh, data quality on our site has kind of looked like this. So it starts off with product inception. Uh, which involves data engineering and the business stakeholders and product management. And then it goes into the uh, dev test cycle. Here you have the quality engineers and data engineers uh, working to perform the tests. And for the most part, tests are written and executed and the results are stored in Excel sheets where validations are performed. And then once things look good, they are shipped, the product is shipped into production. And after it's been in production for a while, the business users, usually the, the ones who interact with the data the most, they see issues with the data quality and they raise uh, the concern. And then it goes into the issue fix development and fix validation cycle after which the batch is then shipped into production 
And unfortunately, as time goes, there as more changes are made to the data product, there are more issues that come up and the business users have to go through the same cycle. So this this ends up becoming uh, a sort of a never ending cycle. And uh, so we uh, we decided to do something about it as opposed to um, you know having a reactive approach to data quality. So to summarize, uh, the tests are manual. They are written and executed in Excel sheets. There's little to no regression testing capabilities. Uh, once the uh, product has been shipped into production, the tests which were conducted on ma uh, performed manually and, and the results captured in Excel sheets uh, don't really help much with uh, regression testing at all. And then you have the problem of tribal knowledge. Uh, I'm sure that you have folks in your sh respective shops who have a lot of knowledge about a lot of things. Uh, and more often than not, uh, it's, it's not that they are deliberately doing this, but they end up becoming a bottleneck uh, to uh, a better data operations. Or when data qualities arise, we start depending on a very few uh, folks on the team to help with resolving these issues. So that's a tribal knowledge challenge. And then uh, data quality can become expensive because uh, a lot of resources have to be committed to resolving these issues. All right, so let's take a look at the uh, proposed solution and the solution that uh, I'm showing here is a product agnostic version of the solution. So this is before we went around and shopped for a solution. Uh, this is what we uh, decided should be the ideal uh, solution for data quality. So, so what does this look like? Let's look at the, the facets of this. So we wanted to build a unified data quality platform. So a, a platform that could be used by business stakeholders, data governance uh, stakeholders, and other stakeholders, including engineering, who can interact with this platform and author data contracts. And uh, these data contracts can then be injected into various uh, points of the software development lifecycle. So on our side, we have a metadata uh, driven framework for all of transformation. So what we were planning to do is uh, use these expectations that are created on the platform and injected into the CICD pipelines and also after the product has been shipped into production, uh, use these expectations against uh, various points in time during automated ELT processes. And um, on top of that is to surface data quality incidents. For the most part, data quality is a, a sort of a silent failure. It occurs and the system says that everything looks okay, but usually it is not. There are some uh, data quality issues are a little sneaky and uh, uh, having these issues surfaced using our incident management uh, and uh, triage process is a non-negotiable. Uh, so that, as you can see here on the top right corner, we have incidents that the platform generates. We have in a tie in with those now, and then the command center would page on call and after which the triage process uh, happens. So this is a, a gist of what we uh, what we are aspiring to build. So uh, just want to let you know that this is an initiative that is in flight, and we are still in the process of implementing this. So this is not completely done on our side. All right. So the objectives of a uh, data quality solution: uh, empowered governance. So uh, the 
stakeholders, the data governance folks can contribute directly to operations by defining data quality contracts for the different critical data sets. Uh, data observability, so we can see how data sets have, uh, from a quality perspective, been over a, a course of time. Uh, for example, if there are critical data sets that have repeatedly shown data quality issues, what can be done to improve the quality going forward, as opposed to uh, doing a, a, a batch sort of a fix to improve the data quality. And then increased participation. So this is not just, so a, a data modernization initiative is not just a technical problem. It is an organizational challenge as well. So as part of this initiative, there's a shift in philosophy that we have undertaken that the data products are not owned by the technical teams, but rather by the domain in which the, the uh, data set belongs to, which means that domain owners or folks in a specific domain, we are requesting them to participate a little more in the data quality so they can come in and write the contracts as opposed to engineering writing the contracts or just engineering writing the contracts. And then uh, from the perspective of engineering discipline, uh, we are implementing contemporary engineering practices. Um, I, I, I'm not making uh, 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 very, uh, uh, well, it, it's, it's to say that the conventional engineering side of the house is usually ahead of the curve compared to data engineering when it comes to things like quality and testing. Um, so it's uh, so we we wanted to implement these contemporary engineering practices on the data side of the house as well, which includes uh, test driven development and also regression tests and unit tests as part of the uh, uh, the data product build and deployment cycle. All right, and we didn't uh, really just just blindly pick sort of off the uh, available solutions out there. We performed a uh, vendor selection process and uh, we had a scorecard. So these are some of the uh, facets uh, or some of the characteristics that we were looking for in a solution. Starting off with user friendliness, this is to enable the uh, non-technical folks, like I mentioned, uh, data governance folks, and also the business folks to contribute directly to data quality and data governance. Uh, connectivity, so uh, pre-built connectors to the data lake, which in our case uh, is primarily Databricks and Delta format. And then uh, we have some Snowflake implementation as well. And then automation patterns. So we have uh, CI-CD integration and also embedding checks into the ELT pipelines itself um, during automated runs. Then instant management integration with uh, ServiceNow, like I mentioned in the, uh, the previous uh, slide. And no data shuffling. So this is critical because we would like to retain our data within our VPC without having to shuffle it uh, outside of our VPC to an external system and then back. Uh, so uh, I, the ideal mechanism was a push down where the check that is uh, defined on the platform is translated to the target system to SQL dialect and executed against the target system. And then we have uh, identity access management and security. So we have, uh, uh, so we uh, all uh, access to systems are driven using uh, Active Directory and uh, SAML, and we also have multi-factor authentication with uh, the possibility of VPC deployments. So these are some of the uh, uh, non-negotiables that uh, we had as part of our vendor selection scorecard, and before we ended up with uh, choosing Soda as our uh, solution that helps us implement all of this.
All right. So let's get into uh, uh, the details a little. So there's contracts and expectations. So um, a contract can be defined as a set of expectations for a data set. So these are some of the minimum expectations that we are implementing across the board for all data sets. So starting off with freshness, um, we cannot expect business to take uh, the right decisions without timely data. So freshness, this is a check that makes sure that the data that is made available on the reports to business is uh, fresh, as in some executive reports have to be completed. The data should be refreshed by say 6 a.m. Uh, every day. And we make sure that these data sets that feed those reports comply with that uh, freshness expectation. Then uniqueness, um, I'm sure, uh, a lot of you in your warehouses or your your lakes, you have you know dimensions and facts. Uh, so dimension, especially from a dimensional data perspective, if there are any duplicates, for example, then those uh, duplicates in dimensional data can have cascading impacts across the board. So aggregations down the line can also. Uh, be duplicated because dimensional data has duplicates. So uniqueness, we make sure that uh, the, the the combination of columns is unique for uh, the different data sets, for, for the dimensional data sets. And we have volume. Volume is a prime example of a silent failure. This is where, let's say, a data set receives uh, 10,000 records a day and then one day it receives only a hundred records. Um, now, from a system's perspective, everything is fine, but uh, you can see that uh, there's a drastic drop in the volume of records that the data set has received. So this uh, now becomes an issue. This, this goes unnoticed till uh, business takes a look at the, the reports and sees that the volume of sales, for example, has dropped considerably. So that's uh, volume. There's some expectation uh, around volume. And then we have nulls. So this is a rather straightforward. We just check if there are nulls in a column when it should not have nulls, uh, making sure that uh, there is uh, uh, proper values being populated in the different columns. And you have referential integrity. For example, uh, we have a uh, store dimension data set and downstream, if there's a reference to a store, then the, the uh, data in that column should be part of the dimensional data set, should, have, should, could be, should be traceable back to the dimensional data. If not, if there is some random number there that does not belong to uh, the store dimension, then that should be flagged as an issue. And then we have uh, schema. Uh, so this is where uh, if there is a, uh, uh, a change that has been introduced inadvertently uh, by in, through the uh, development process, then uh, we can have this captured. If the structure of the table is changing inadvertently, then uh, that can be flagged as an error. So a, a, a contract can also, well, if you want to define a contract, um, it's more a, uh, a promissory note that the producer makes to the consumer. So uh, the producer of the data set says that this data set will be available by this time. And then uh, there are these other expectations that the data set should meet. So going back to the definition, a contract is a collection of a, a set of expectations. And uh, these are some of the minimum expectations that uh, we are implementing for the data sets. And then uh, here, uh, next is the uh, custom expectations. So these require a little more domain knowledge. Um, so, uh, uh, th these are expectations or these are the, the quote unquote tribal knowledge that uh, is now being materialized in the form of uh, contracts on the, uh, the SOTA platform through the SOTA checks language. 
So uh, a combination of uh, data catalog, curated data catalog, and the expectations that we write on the SODA platform together form a comprehensive documentation of the different data sets that we use. So this is the additional benefit. Um, so this is to minimize the amount of uh, tribal knowledge and codify it somewhere so that it can be used down the line, either from a systems or SDLC perspective where we perform regression tests, uh, all, all, or uh, just from a general knowledge perspective where we are onboarding someone, they wanna understand the uh, data sets better uh, from both a functional and also a technical perspective. They can uh, take a look at these expectations and better understand these data sets. So proactive data quality. So there are uh, uh, three categories of proactivity. So data supply chain. So uh, as you can visualize, data makes multiple hops before it reaches its final destination. So uh, we start off, we are starting off our initiative towards the end, closer to the reports. But as we progress down the line, we intend to push the uh, checks earlier on the data supply chain, maybe all the way back to the source. Um, ideally where transformations happen, or also we can, they, we have noted some issues that happen at the source site itself. So ideally we would like to have these checks run uh, all the way back up to the source at every hop on the data supply chain. And then point of materialization. So the most proactive is in memory. So uh, in the case, in our case, Databricks, we have uh, Spark as the ELT engine. So Spark creates data frames. Data frames are uh, data structures that are created in memory in a distributed fashion. And uh, we can execute checks on the these data frames before they are persisted onto the data lake or onto uh, whatever your target storage is. So this is the most proactive um, the second one is uh, after the fact, after it has materialized, we can either synchronously or asynchronously run checks on the data set that has been materialized. Or the least proactive is after batch. Uh, so since we are all, uh, you know, in, in the beginning stages or we are uh, not far down the road from an implementation perspective, we are targeting the after batch uh, approach to uh, running checks and we are gonna go more proactive down the line that is back to materialization and ultimately back to in-memory checks. And from a, a software development lifecycle perspective, so test-driven development, uh, eventually when we mature, when this framework that we are implementing matures, we would ideally like to create the contracts first along with the you know, maybe right after requirements gathering or when the, uh, or during the inception stage, so we can have the tests or the contracts defined before the development even happens. Um, that that is uh, that is a that requires a lot of maturity, a lot of experience with our data and uh, the the technical uh, expertise as well. And uh, eventually, we will get to this stage. And then we also have uh, CI/CD pipelines. We've started embedding the uh, checks in the CI/CD pipelines, so uh, we we are uh, there for now. All right. So that's uh, types of proactivity, and then a brief glimpse into the uh, uh, the sort of platform. So this is a screenshot that shows the uh, the UI. And Zoe here is a sample data. This is a, a single table that has been scanned. And uh, it shows what, what how many checks are running against it, what is the health of the, the data set. And on the right side, you see a panel that shows at check. So this is the, uh, this, this provides a very user-friendly way of defining uh, checks for the uh, data sets. Um, I'm sure uh, there's, there's a little uh, video or there's more documentation on SODA's website, which shows you how to add a check. 
but uh, this is the screenshot I have for now. All right, so yeah, so this is for example, if you want to add a numeric check um, for the different data sets. So there's, uh, this one's adding the max length for a region number and it shouldn't be greater than three, then uh, this check is expected to fail. So the alerting mechanism is as well, you can either set it at fail or warning uh, so that uh, you can decide only high priority checks should be failed and the rest can be just warnings so that uh, failures get escalated as P1s in uh, the incident management and response cycle for more pro for more uh, quicker response time for triage. And this is another example of uh, at the dashboard for a data set. And uh, this just shows the health and the incidents that the data set has ha had over the last few days. And uh, so there's a, there's a couple of resources here. So one is Soda Core, which is the uh, open source version of Soda if you want to take it out for a spin. And that's the uh, link to the uh, documentation for uh, the Soda framework. And uh, very high level, uh, how this, this architecture, uh, how it looks like. So you have uh, stakeholders defining contracts and checks on the managed platform and you create a scan. And this is where you define the schedule and uh, also define the connection to uh, your, uh, your target system where your data resides. And you have a SOTA agent, which can either be self or SOTA hosted. And the checks that you define here are pushed down over to your target system in this, that system's dialect. And uh, only the metadata is sent back to the agent. And, uh, well, let me take a step back. So you, you can turn off all sampling so that there is no data shipped back from your system over to SODA. Or if you are okay with sampling, then there will be, uh, for example, fail records that are sent back over to SODA that you can take a look at what's going on, what uh, errors are, are occurring because the checks are failing. Have examples of records that fail the expectations. All right, so um, uh, all, all great uh, ideas. Um, they are, they're usually inspired by something else. And in this case, uh, we have modeled the data quality framework and data quality and data governance framework around the professional sports operating model. So on the left is the uh, professional sports, uh, the, the different aspects. For example, is league governance. So this is, uh, this is where your Adam Silvers um, and your Roger Goodells operate. And on the right side, we have data governance. And lucky for us, we have Latravia on, on the call with us. Uh, and uh, the franchisees, so the, the, the governance defines the uh, contracts and the evolution of the contracts. The franchises, uh, the, the teams uh, abide by the contracts and along the same lines, the uh, different domains uh, abide by the contracts and also help define and evolve the contracts that on, on the platform. And the athletes who are part of the teams, the equivalent for that are the uh, the engineers who uh, uh, adhere to the contracts that have been defined. All right, with that, uh, my section of this presentation is done. I will hand this over to Latravia now. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys are having a great day. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm Latravia and I'm the data governance manager here at Abercrombie. Um, before this weekend, I had every intention on coming on here and talking about our data quality strategy. My governance team defined the critical data elements. We met with data owners and business on business critical rules, and we implemented them in SOTA. And we even talked about remediation and monitoring. 
But I think we're all familiar with how important it is to engage business users when talking about data quality. And in my opinion, that has always been the focus of, of this because they are directly engaged with the bottom line. And most of the time, our business users scream the loudest when things go wrong. We need to talk to business users because they are the ones that use our data. They are the ones that report on it. They are the ones that experience the repercussions for having poor quality data. A governance team should be able to connect technology processes and stakeholders of our data, not just business users, not just engineers, but all of our stakeholders. And in the spirit of data governance, we should be able to adapt and change course when we recognize new opportunities. So studies show that 50% of data quality issues stem from engineering. And I'm sure when this study was taken, I know for a fact they weren't talking about the engineers that we have at Abercrombie or any of you on the call. So we're on the other side of the 50%. So we're all good there. But with studies like this, why are we not involving and embedding those teams into our data quality process? Even I failed at distinguishing the true athletes, as Anna put it, so standing up soda, I focused only on business critical. I talked to DEOs. Um, I only focused on data stewards. But we have to shift our mindsets and the way that we work to include everyone. So how do we do this? First thing that we do is share. So we have to share our playbooks to allow our athletes to perform at optimal capacity. Data governance tools should not only be leveraged and used by the business users. Data governance tools should not only be used by the data governance team. We spend so much time and money on tools and updating processes to only focus on half of the problem. Not only do we need to engage business users for data quality, we also have to engage and share the benefits with our engineering team. Sharing data quality tools equips them to proactively detect and resolve issues, ensuring that our data remains accurate and reliable through development. And this collaboration enhances system performance and fosters accountability for data integrity. And we, with SOTO, we're allowed to do all of this. Secondly, we must empower. Um, our data governance team partnered with our engineering team to do a POC for the solutions and implement SOTA. And our engineering team was empowered to drive the changes. Our first two checks that we implemented, um, you can see some of the examples here, um, was the freshness checks and the schema checks. And so these checks could have been missed if we only leveraged what our business users thought was important. There is so much knowledge about data migration and transformation that always isn't known by business users. So SOTA gives us one place to integrate these contracts and allow even the most non-tech person, sometimes myself, to be able to use this resource. And because of that, we're able to translate tech language like SQL queries into a language anyone can understand. So this tool has allowed us to integrate both business and engineers into one tool to be able to work towards the same cause, which is good quality of data. Thirdly, we offer a sense of collaboration. We all know engineers are the most social people that we know, and they have all the time in the world to have meetings. As a governance team, we have to make it easy for people to ask questions and offer suggestions about the health of our data. We utilize discussion boards in SOTO for all users to propose checks or ask questions and comment and they route to our governance team before being implemented. Um, and this allows us to be able to monitor and use the tool and gives us a sense of community and a place to start having these data quality questions. So again, we are putting the use of this tool into the hands of the actual users of the data and the people that need it the most. Um, and so it allows us to have this one forum to do this. And then lastly, as a governance team, we have to continue to monitor. Um, at any point, we should know the health of our data. And by not engaging engineers, we're still only getting half of the picture. The idea of data quality isn't to point fingers, but to identify gaps. And as an organization, we want to move from a retroactive approach to a proactive approach, like Anna mentioned earlier. And by seeing a clear picture, we can identify causes and potential solutions to where the problem actually lies. Dashboards like the ones that we have in SOTA that we're implementing um, enable quick identification of issues, allow engineers to address data quality problems, also allows business users to address um, quality problems, and it maintains system reliability. At any point in time, you should be able to know exactly where your data stands as it relates to health. Um, and dashboards like the one that we're seeing on the screen 
gives us a view into that to where anybody from leadership or anyone from data custodians, data stewards can come here um, and see the health of their data. So as you implement your data quality strategy, as a governance team, I suggest you partner with your engineers. And as an engineer, I suggest you feel empowered and concerned about the health of your data. Um, I believe we're only as successful as we are because of this initiative was driven by our engineering team. Yes, business critical contracts are very important, but by only focusing on that, you could be potentially missing out on the other 50% of your data quality issues. Okay, and with that, Shannon, we'll turn it back over to you. Perfect, thank you so much for this great presentation and information. Uh, and for our community out there, if you have questions for Latravia and Anan, then please uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel and just answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, um, and on uh, the there's a questions a couple of questions that came in um, during your presentation. What tool are you using for your data quality? You did mention this um, at some of it uh, uh, already, but uh, just to reiterate, and does it handle both pipeline versus consumption layer quality versus uh, data versus information quality? Yeah, so uh, uh, we we use uh, Soda that. Uh, the Soda is the data quality platform. You can uh, get more information at soda.io. And the next question, does it handle both pipeline versus consumption layer? Uh, when you say pipeline, so I, is, are you saying pluggability into an ELT pipeline? If yes, then yeah, uh, you can include the uh, checks as part of the pipeline. And consumption layer quality. I'm I'm not sure. And data versus information quality. I mean, I I need yeah. a little more clarification on this. Yeah, sure. And and, and maybe the questioner can add some additional uh, information there. And Latreve, anything you want to add there? Uh, no, uh, nothing for me to add. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Um. So. Uh, um. So I'll move on. I'll give the questioner some time to add some clarification there. Uh, what happens when the two, when there is data from two different domains combined? Who's the owner? So that usually um, we have. So there are some data sets that are classified as common. And the technical team does take ownership of some of those data sets. But for the most part, we have identified business domain. So every data set belongs to a business domain for the most part, except for a, a small handful of them. Yes, so a prerequisite for us um, for data quality was doing all of that background work to identify those data owners. Um, with that, we also stood up a data catalog tool. And so that sort of helped us with identifying who owns what. And when it came to um, fields or columns that have multiple or cross domain like impacts, um, we sort of had those conversations before implementing this to see um, who should really own, own it at the end of the day. Um, and we've identified those and also make sure that we have communication. So if there's changes that are happening, um, we know to who to identify, who owns it, but we also know who also sort of wants to be in the know. Very nice. Um, well, so uh, I may have missed this, but does Soda, do you know if it's Soda integrates with Microsoft Fabric? Well, we don't really use Microsoft Fabric, so I cannot answer that question. If someone from Soda could, or someone from Soda would be the better person to answer this. Yeah, yeah. Let me, I can pull up that information too. Um, and what data storage solution do you use with Soda? So, so right we now, have, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So we have the uh, Delta Lake that, um, 
the Databricks and Spark is the compute for that. And that's on your traditional blob storage. And uh, we also have Snowflake. So we have both uh, the Databricks Delta and also Snowflake uh, that we use Soda to check against. Perfect. Thank you. And I found um, the link from Soda's uh, website so you can see what they integrate with. I just put it in the chat there as well. So, um, so y'all can have that answer. Uh, a lot of integration there. Um, do you uh, utilize a data catalog? And if so, who do you, who do you use, utilize? Yes, we, we do have a data catalog. Um, currently, we are using um, Informatica Data Catalog and Lineage. But it is not connected at this time to SODA. So to two different initiatives. Sure, gotcha. And how do data products, data contract, and data quality feed into the catalog? So there is no um, direct connection integration from data catalog to our data contracts. Um, like that. But our data catalog, we are able to identify critical data elements, which we identify with the business. Um, and that has allowed us to know which elements we need to write our contracts and data quality rules on. So it's a manual connection that we're doing inside with our governance team to ensure that the um, critical data elements that we've identified are also monitored in SOTA. Ah, very cool. And so on that Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, real quick about that. So it, I'm not sure if that's something on Soda's roadmap to integrate with the Informatica Data Quality, uh, Informatica Data Catalog tool, but um, Soda does have connectivity with a few others. Uh, I believe Atlan is one of them. Um, where I, I, where you can take a look at the docs to understand. It's either Atlan or Alation, but there are data qual uh, data cataloging tools that uh, Soda can uh, inter uh, interface with out of box. Yeah, yeah, I do see a, a few listed there in the in the list that I put in the chat. Um, thank you. Yeah, and um, on a what was if any the performance overhead of implementing data quality checks into your pipeline SDLC. So yes, there there is a uh, uh, performance cost, but uh, so that depends on you know whether you want to run it um, in memory or uh, as you know very proactively against data frames or uh, after it materializes or asynchronously after it materializes. Uh, but I think. This should not be treated as an overhead, but rather the cost to ensure quality of data. Uh, I mean, there's, there's no such thing as free stuff. So there's there's definitely a cost involved here. And that is, uh, you know, it could be a little more time for a data set to be available for consumption downstream, or it could be that additional compute that is required to uh, perform or run the checks against the materialized data sets. It's, it's also, when we think about cost, it's the time that it takes for someone to find these issues and have to like do the rework. And so when we're thinking about like a data quality tool, I think it's also important to outweigh the, like the, the man hours that it takes to actually um, solve for having poor data in your system. We spend a lot of time, engineers spend a lot of time, business users spend a lot of time. Um, we even think about um, like implications, you know, where it goes to like the government. Um, so I think when you're thinking about a data quality tool, it's very important to sort of um, outweigh the actual cost that you're spending for the tool, but realize the cost on the end that you're saving. So which team owns monitoring production data quality? Is it IT, stakeholder, governance, or all? 
So when issues are surfaced by this platform and uh, it's sent across to ServiceNow, the first response is definitely IT. Um, but governance and other business stakeholders, they can go to go onto the platform and see how that data set has has uh, you know, the quality of the data set over time. You can get those metrics by going onto the platform. I, I would also add that it's, it's a combination. Um, so like you said, the first line of defense is our IT partners, but for this tool to work successfully, um, I think that ownership lies with the governance, just to make sure that we're all aligned on these contracts. We have the proper sign off. Um, we're being transparent about the numbers that we're seeing. We're also putting in um, process improvements, whether that's changes to job aids or suggesting changes to the way that our data is moving. Um, and that's also ownership on our business to make sure that um, the rules that we put in place are actually the rules that matter. Um, we like to put ownership on our business and with Soto, we're allowed to do that. We give our business users, we will give our business users access to this tool to be able to um, control and, and, and see the health of our data. Um, so one owner, I, I don't see it, but um, governance is a key player to make sure that all hands are on deck when it comes to data quality. Mm, I love it. Uh, and very important. Uh, so any suggestions on how an organization can quote unquote shift ownership of the data from technology database administrators or data management data engineers to business stewards? And I agree that much of the data quality issues are caused by by some some engineers and administrators. I think one is um, to um, to really identify those data owners. I think when you give people ownership of things, um, it, it sort of helps. And I think just too many times I've seen it, like we just live in a gray area to where people don't want to take ownership in that. Um, people want to yell and scream when things are wrong, but no one truly knows who the owner is. And I think our first step of um, working with our data entity owners, identifying those data stores um, is the first step into um, into that process. Thank you. And so uh, we are, so Dataversity is a vendor neutral company. Um, but there's a question here, you know, what made you decide to use Soda over any other um, data quality tool? You know, what was it that about Soda that that was um, the right answer for you? So we found that uh, Soda was a little more flexible from a perspective of uh, how or when we inject the checks into the pipelines or, you know, in, into the SDLC uh, process. So uh, we 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 really wanted that uh, flexibility from an operations perspective. So I mean, there there were some other uh, you know competitors who fared. Uh, I mean, not not as well as Soda, but uh, it was close to where uh, Soda ended up. But uh, I I want to say from an engineering perspective, engineering and operations perspective. Uh, Soda was way more flexible than the other solutions out there. Mm, very, very cool. Um, and then, uh, Latrevia, the biggest challenge with data management and data quality is uh, articulating and showing business value for investments made. How are you achieving this in your organization so the funding persists? I, I can agree with that. Um, when we started our data quality journey and, and we're still going through it, um, I, I think it's hard for people to see how things um, that they're not used to affect them. And so that was one of our biggest questions when we start from the business. We're asking them for our time to help us write these rules. Well, it's just, you know, why make time for this? Um, I, I think you have to have some sort of like KPIs um, 
we have to do some type of data observe, um, observe, oh, I'm sorry, I can't speak. We have to observe our data. Um, and I think it's important to also um, be able to pull from other resources and, and speak on, like, I guess, just potential threats out there. Um, even if you can pull from, even if we can, you know, take a survey and see where we've had issues in the past. I think if you can equate it to time save, that is a big key to that. Um, but it, it's really, um, that's, that's a hard, a hard one to do. You, you have to show that it's important and that we're actually saving time. So over time, people will see um, how these data quality rules have really changed the, the data migration and the transformation of our data. Um, and I think you just have to have constant communication to show people like this is working. This is what we've um, sort of missed out on and, you know, we'll continue to move forward like that. Perfect. Thank you. So how do you enforce SOTA rules in the development pipeline to ensure that no data quality rules are violated? So um, when developers create a uh, branch and uh, they they create a, uh, a merge request, so that is a point in time where uh, we run the ELT job with the uh, change. And also after that materialization is done, we run the checks against the data that was uh, recently materialized. So those, uh, those rules are injected into the CICD pipeline. So even though the, the uh, contracts are defined on the platform, you can have or you can retrieve the YAML version of that contract and you can run that uh, against the data set in the pipeline. Thank you so much. And we have lots of great questions coming in, just about uh, eight minutes left in the uh, webinar. So we'll try and get to as many as we can. And feel free to put them in the Q&A portion of your screen. Uh, that helps me to find them. Um, so what is the most practical approach to quantify the value of data governance initiatives, such as data quality checks from a financial perspective? Again, I, I think you have to understand um, where your data is today and understand the uses and the problems that you have. It's, it's really hard to um, quantify the value if you're not honest and, and say where you are today, and not just with engineers, but also with business users. And I think you have to take stock of that first. Um, that... It is that is very hard, but I I, I do agree that um, you you just have to observe where the data is today and and have honest and open communication about where we need to be. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it is a hard thing, like you say, Latravia, and we get this question every webinar, <laughs> no matter what the topic. How how do we how do we build the ROI? Um, and we've had a couple of those today, as you know. Um, so, uh. What have been your biggest challenges or successes with implementing your strategy? Honestly, I think it goes back to what we were just talking about. How do you convince your business users to take the time out of their day um, to help out with this initiative where we're not really sure um, what the outcome will be? And so I think the biggest challenge it has been so far um, was getting our business users um, with us. I would say that just learning from my experience, what we tried to do was we tried to do several different domains um, at one time because we were working on you know speed. I think it's beneficial to, to take one domain through the entire process um, and then come back and do sort of like a show and tell with everyone else. Um, so they can see the importance, they can see how it works. You, you know exactly how much time that you're asking them for. And I think people are, are, are more on board when they can see the entire process. I love it. Uh, and 
Latrevia, where do you report into? Does data governance report into a business division independent of IT? Our reporting is um, a digital in tech. Yes, so it's um, not necessarily the business. I am on more on the IT side. How do you ensure data quality and what techniques do you implement as a data manager director, especially in the fintech and healthcare sectors? Well, I know you're not in fintech and health tech, but, <laughs> but how do you, how do you, when, what techniques do you implement it as a data manager and director? Right. So we started with the business with identifying those critical data elements. Um, we also look to see which elements are across multiple reports or have impacts to multiple reports. So we started there. Um, so lots of conversations with the business. Um, just because I am not in day to day with data, I, I do think it's important to lean on those that are. Um, and, and that's where we started. Thank you so much. And I, I know uh, you just uh, typed an answer to this, but let me ask it out loud just so everyone can hear the answer. Um, are you saying that after implementing SOTA data quality solutions, you don't have data quality issues? I assume the answer is no. So processes. Definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> no. Have you implemented tech new data quality issues and how do they get addressed? I think governance together is a journey. Um, so it's not an in all be all implementing a data quality tool um, doesn't just solve data quality. Um, data is forever changing. The way that we use our data is forever changing. And part of governance team is opening up the, the doors and the communication for us to solve new problems. Um, so yes, we started with our data entity owners, but as we onboard new projects and new source systems, um, there will forever be quality ways for us to implement SOTA um, and check our quality of our data. So the, the work will always come. Indeed. And uh, are there any automated processes to enrich the data? At this time, we are not um, utilizing the data enrichment in SOTA. All right. Well, thank you both for this amazing presentation. It has just been a pleasure to hear what you guys are doing and how you're doing it. Uh, and thanks to all our attendees for being so engaged in everything that we do. Just really, really love it. Um, again, I just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording and anything else. Um, and uh, our speakers LinkedIn is and are in that. So um, feel free to reach out. So thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Thank you.